Hello and welcome to ID Talk, answers from an infectious disease expert. I'm Dr. Sean Elliott, a pediatric infectious disease specialist with Tucson Medical Center, professor emeritus of pediatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and medical director of infectious diseases and immunizations at the Arizona chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. This podcast has been created to answer questions from our chapter's members about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the week of December 20th, and as you all know, Omicron is here, it is hot, it is taking over our our caseload, although Delta remains quite a significant burden in many parts of the country. Worldwide, there have been 275,564,000 plus total cases, and unfortunately, over 5.3 million deaths since the start of the pandemic. Here in the United States, we now are over 51 million total cases since the start, and we passed yet another unfortunate milestone, now have uh, almost 808,000 deaths from uh, COVID-19 since the start. In pediatric patients, uh, the report from the AAP as of December 16th, we have uh, 7.37 million total cases, which is 17.3% of the cumulative total of cases. That comes out to almost 9,800 pediatric cases per 100,000 pediatric population. And perhaps the, the bigger tell is the weekly numbers. Last week, or the week of the reporting, to December 16th, uh, we turned in almost 24% of total new cases in this country were pediatric age range. Those numbers have been about you know 24 up to as high as 30%. So we continue to turn in a significant number of new pediatric cases. Here in Arizona, same report, same date. Um, we are at uh, just over 263,000 total cases from zero through 19. 19.8% of our total cases are pediatric in Arizona. And that comes out to 14,305 peds cases per 100,000 pediatric population. I don't know if this is a silver lining or not, but we're no longer in the top five, not even in the top 10 of states for pediatric cases. Arizona came in at number 11 on this most recent report. So it's a good thing we're dropping. It'd be great to be much lower than that, but there you go. Uh, We remain at 50 deaths uh, related to COVID-19 from the start of the pandemic. As discussed in the last pandemic, uh, excuse me, in the last podcast, mixing my peas there, not all those cases are directly due to viral disease itself, but in many cases related to the societal impacts of the pandemic on healthcare delivery. For example, increased rates of completed suicide, deaths from motor vehicle accidents, uh, deaths from other infections, unable to or unwilling to access medical care. So all those things are, are filled into the mix of that total of 50. So far as Arizona is reporting, we remain at 12 specific deaths related to the virus itself, all of those in individuals who, with one exception actually, uh, who had no medical comorbidities and who were living in rural underserved parts of the state. So healthcare delivery absolutely affected by the pandemic as you all well know. So uh, again, a nice list of great questions. But the first group of questions has to do with rates of MISCI or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children after COVID-19 vaccination. And, and very, very appropriate questions. And, and I guess both plus and minus, there, there's very little data to ask to answer them. So the, the question is, uh, in those children five years and up who are fully vaccinated, this is a emerging small, like 10 to up to maybe 20% of kids, do, and if they have a breakthrough COVID infection after full vaccination, are they developing MISC? Uh, and if so, what are the rates? Well, to, to, to start off with the first part of that, there are thankfully very few documented cases of breakthrough infections in fully vaccinated children age five and up. Yes, they occur, um, but if so, many of them are, are mild asymptomatic and, and we only know about them through very infrequently performed seroprevalence assays. Uh, and even that's a very difficult study to do because you have to swab a whole bunch of noses uh, in kids who otherwise feel fine. So, so uh, it is unknown what the actual rate of breakthrough infections are uh, in the country, in the world, uh, and, and certainly in Arizona. Then, if you take the risk of MISC, which is even far lower than that, and estimates in in the very first several surges of the pandemic 
put the risk of MISC somewhere at around 1 to 3 percent without actually any specific comorbidities to predict other than a suggestion in parts of the country with larger populations of black and Hispanic patients that there was a risk for those ethnicities to have MISC. But again, that might have just been pot, not just, but it might have been population data based and a selection bias based on the, the uh, demographics of that society. So long story short, there have been no reported cases in peer reviewed literature or even on the listservs on which I sit of breakthrough infections precipitating MISC. That that could happen, absolutely, it's a possibility. But I think we can all very comfortably say the risk of that is incredibly low, bordering on theoretic. So as we have our vaccine uh, conversations with those who are vaccine questioning or vaccine hesitant, we can add into the mix an additional benefit, which is to, to significantly reduce the risk of both breakthrough infection and also MISC, which really has been the, a major carrier of the morbidity, long-term morbidity and mortality in pediatric COVID-19. So yes, as the, the questions go, do vaccines not only prevent severe infection, death, and transmission of COVID in children, but do they also reduce the rates of MISC? The answer is an emphatic yes, thank heavens. In my own experience goes on the question, have I noticed children who developed MISC in the hospital, are they mostly vaccinated or unvaccinated or does it not matter? My, again, personal experience, treating experience is 100% of the MISC patients that I have treated in hospital were unvaccinated. A fair number of them were at an age where they could have been vaccinated and the family was on the fence. That actually goes still true for those who are hospitalized with, M with, with COVID-19, you know, whether it's, it's moderate to severe requiring oxygen, steroids from desivir or not. With very rare exceptions, actually, no, in my personal experience, all of the patients I've treated uh, have been fully unvaccinated. So, you know, vac vaccines in kids has have significant potential impact to prevent hospitalization, to prevent morbidity, to prevent mortality, and, and also to prevent MISC. And then the final question is, have I, have I seen MISC affect both populations equally? No, nope, absolutely not. 100% of cases uh, in my experience, and, and I, I, from what I understand of ongoing population studies throughout the country, uh, this is true elsewhere, uh, MISC is a disease of the unvaccinated, period. Excellent. All right, next questions. This has to do with the rapid tests, another hot topic. As we start to inch closer to antivirals that work best when used in the first several days of illness, of course, there is a, a significant increasing need for rapid diagnostics, which means at home or at the practice, rapid screening tests. Similarly, as, as we now, of course, are, are hot upon the, the travel season for the holidays, same thing. So the, the question is, uh, with the rapid tests, the data I've heard suggested as much as a 40% false negative rate. Yeah, that, that, that is uh, likely very true. Um, however, there may be a slight bit of apples and oranges here. Uh, many of the at-home rapid tests remain antigen-based, which do carry a significant false negative rate and also a not insignificant false positive rate. So, so as the, the current recommendations go, at-home rapid test, which is negative and yet a strong clinical suspicion of either disease or strong exposure, those are patients who should be followed up with with a PCR-based or a, to be fair, nucleic acid uh, test, which is gonna be far more sensitive and far more specific. For the, the practice-based and, and other rapid screening tests, which are available through many of our pharmacies, through our practices, through the county health departments, those by and large are PCR-based or, or nucleic acid uh, antigen testing, um, which are far more sensitive, upwards of 90% sensitive, uh, meaning a, a potential uh, of maybe 10% false negative rate. The specificity of those is, is, is significantly close to 100%. So a, a positive screen test from the County Health Department, from one of the many PCR tests that are available at pharmacies, drugstores, uh, and in our practices, that carries a lot of weight. Again, any negative in the, in the presence of a strong clinical suspicion, at the very least, uh, should be followed up with a repeat test uh, and or more formal you know, nasal swab for, for the PCR test. What is the data on home rapid tests? 
Well, the, the data is pretty much as I've described. <laughs> it is a shifting target because a fair number of those rapid tests uh, have yet to be FDA approved. There, there's a backlog in getting them approved and on the market, although actually they're on the market, they're just not approved. I, I should qualify that. So in terms of studying then the validity uh, of the commercially available rapid tests, um, that, that data remains to be in progress uh, and, and we don't have a whole awful lot to go on other than a strong suspicion that none of them will be as sensitive or specific as, as billed by the manufacturer. Those few tests that are FDA approved carry with them a much more and clearly stated sensitivity and specificity that, that I think we can, we can rely on. All right, next set of questions. What do we know about the timeline regarding COVID vaccines for ages two to four years and six months to two years? Oh boy. Well, unfortunately, that's a, first of all, um, the data is, is coming to us from Pfizer, which is furthest along in its testing in both of those age populations. The, the data also it was just preliminarily released just this last week, and it is a bit concerning. For six months to two years, those infants were tested with a, a two vaccine series of Pfizer vaccine at three micrograms. That's one tenth of the adult dose that, that many of us received um, with our, our other uh, Pfizer COVID vaccines. Six months to two years actually had a, a decent, adequate seroprotective response bordering on levels attained in uh, young adults, adolescents, and, and adult adults. So yay, great, fantastic, that, that's wonderful, probably uh, protective. I'll leave aside for the moment the question of boosters for all ages. Unfortunately, ages two years through four years had a less than expected and a less than adequate seroprotective response to that same one-tenth of a dose or a three microgram aliquots uh, of the Pfizer vaccine to the point where Pfizer is now saying, okay, yep, that was not as we expected. We're now going to test the impact of a third dose given at least two months out, meaning a, a booster dose, very, very similar to what Johnson & Johnson did to see if, if that actually brings the, the uh, seroprotect response up to levels expected. Because of that delay, then, the, the data being submitted to, to the FDA, at least for two through four, uh, is going to be delayed until spring. Uh, current estimates are not before April, perhaps even May of 2022. So that's the timing. We, we have a ways to go. The, the hope had been, if the data had been uh, as, as good as suggested by the, the testing uh, ages five through 11, that perhaps we might have had an indication for an emergency use authorization as early as, as January, like just in a couple of weeks. Wouldn't that have been fantastic? Unfortunately, the data was not that good, and so now there is a, a delay. So as always, stay tuned, it's coming. No word yet on whether Pfizer will proceed with the indication for six months or two years. My suspicion is that they'll continue to study both and, and do a, a combined uh, application uh, sometime in early spring of, of 2022. Regarding the boosters, uh, I think we've all seen that both Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are approved as a booster dose for all ages 16 and up. That's pushing the limit a little bit for Moderna's initial uh, indication, which was 18 and up. Uh, however, the data is looking quite good for, for adolescents younger than that. So I, I think FDA and now CDC in adopting that recommendation are, are on pretty solid scientific ground. So, so as the booster doses for our, our later adolescents, 16 and up, either for Pfizer or Moderna it is a great idea. Um, also in vaccine news, I think we all saw that uh, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine from Janssen Pharmaceuticals um, has now been de-emphasized, I think, by the FDA as, as a uh, acceptable vaccine, largely due to the, the risk of the vaccine-induced uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia uh, or, or the similar to the autoimmune uh, thrombocytopenia um, and, and rates of, of coagulopathy and, and some deaths reported with that vaccine product. So while it still carries emergency use authorization in this country, uh, the strong recommendation is, is to prefer giving one of the two mRNA vaccines for primary uh, vaccine series. And for those recipients who received a dose or even two doses, perhaps, uh, of the Janssen pharmaceutical vaccine, that they then get at least an additional dose of an mRNA vaccine, either uh, Pfizer or uh, Moderna. To remind you of data that I, I've shared several times in this podcast, 
recipients of a single dose of Janssen Pharmaceuticals, the adenovirus vector vaccine, uh, who then get a second dose of vaccine from Moderna, the Moderna mRNA vaccine, had a 47-fold increase in seroprotective response. Those who got that first dose, the Janssen uh, vaccine, followed by the Pfizer vaccine as a second dose, had a 25-fold increase in seroprotective response. Those compared to a patient who got a second dose of the Janssen pharmaceutical vaccine who had just a fourfold increase. Now that's still not small potatoes, but this is quite a timely conversation as we look at the ability of the various vaccines available in this country and, and worldwide against the Omicron variant. Yes, you knew I was going to get to the Omicron variant at some point in time. So as it now stands, keeping in mind that we're just three weeks into the worldwide surge of Omicron, thank you very much, um, and a heck of a lot has happened, it appears that both Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines retain protective efficacy. How high is not yet uh, stated, but it seems similar to what was achieved against Delta variant and the preceding variants. So those recipients of an mRNA vaccine are riding fairly pretty, especially if they got a booster dose of one of those vaccines, uh, whether it was Pfizer followed by Moderna or Moderna followed by Pfizer or, or same vaccine for the booster, doesn't matter. Those individuals who are boosted are apparently are significantly protected and predicted to be so as Omicron continues to circulate and take over the world. So there you go. There remains urgency to get as many doses of mRNA vaccines into people's arms in this country of all ages as is humanly possible and as we can in terms of uptake. So just the matter is, uh, is getting people in those front doors so we can vaccinate them. All right, so along the lines of the, the boosters, next question, how long does immunity from vaccine boosters tend to last in providing a very high level preventing illness? Um, as a pediatrician, I'm asked for all patient encounters, but I worry about us as vectors for transmission to our most vulnerable patients. So this, this is a fabulous question because it, it's both from our standing as practitioners and our practices in, in the offices, emergency departments, hospitals, etc., cetera, um, but also in terms of societal impact. Again, we're, we're, we're so early into population studies of booster response that, that uh, the absolute data is not yet available. However, the predictive modeling based on vaccine response and, and prior vaccine response after booster is that that high level immunity will last and is protective for up to at least a year, perhaps even longer, to the point where, where some of the scientific talking heads, and you know who they are, are, are suggesting that we may be able to avoid an annual COVID-19 vaccine based on the strength of the boosters, uh, the mRNA boosters. If so, if proven, that would be fantastic. As it now stands, so I, I think we can rest comfortable in at least one year's worth of protection, especially if, if uh, one recently got a booster, we should be good for, for another at least six months to, to even 12 months. Yay, great, fantastic. That, that has to, to do then also with the population itself, with, with the community, uh, in terms of trying to limit circulating virus. Importantly, however, can breakthrough infections occur even in those who are boosted? Sadly, the answer is yes. Unfortunately, uh, it is, and nothing is going to be 100% protective. Even a 90% protective vaccine after a booster is still going to allow for that rare breakthrough infection to occur. Yes, the breakthrough infection is going to be mild, highly unlikely for hospitalization, severe disease, or death, although those cases have been reported as well. So the, the point being that, that it is possible yet still to get breakthrough infection and therefore to be contagious in the clinical setting. So as, I'm sorry to say this, but as a petition to get away from wearing the masks in, in clinical settings and in indoor settings, even despite being boosted, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. From, from a, a perspective of patient safety, the right thing unfortunately is yet still uh, to mask up completely. Now that said, if the mask is worn effectively in the clinical setting, even when seeing a patient who is susceptible, who is fragile, who is perhaps immunocompromised, that should still be okay. Masking even while boosted is I think that the appropriate way to go. 
All right, um, and then the last question is, is what is the latest, latest data on how contagious the Omicron variant is and vaccine efficacy against the variant? Well, I, I, I touched on the vaccine efficacy briefly, uh, and again, to be determined how high those numbers are, just, just to, to think of uh, Pfizer and Moderna against Omicron as being similar as the early days against Delta, which were reported in the high 90s. Yay, great, fantastic. That is with the booster in place. Just two doses of either Pfizer or Moderna is only around guesstimate 70% protective against Omicron or perhaps even less. How contagious is Omicron? Well, it's pretty darn contagious. So early data suggests that it replicates 70 times faster than Delta variant, and Delta replicated four to six times faster than Alpha variant, and Alpha variant replicated another four to six times faster than the, the initial wild type. So, so Omicron is a nasty. It replicates quite quickly and at high viral loads, which therefore theoretically increases its transmissibility, uh, perhaps by a similar factor. That that has happened, I think, is, is unquestionably true. This country went from reporting its very first case of Omicron just over 10 days ago in, in Minnesota, as it turns out, to now 70 to 90 percent of new cases in the United States of America are Omicron. We have gone to becoming the principal strain in this country in just over a week and a half. Holy Toledo, folks, that, that, is, that is blindingly fast. And the same is true in other parts of the world. So the United Kingdom, the European Union, them all are stating that, that Omicron has become or is close to becoming their principal strain uh, for all new cases. So that's the data. It's fast. Uh, it's very efficient. It's interesting, and that this remains to be, I think, uh, confirmed in a peer-reviewed way, but there are suggestions that Omicron variant represents an antigenic shifting event, very much like what occurs with, with influenza pandemics. And thus, Omicron may be a new COVID-19 pandemic. You wanna call it COVID-21? People are gonna be super confused. However, what is theoretically thought to have happened is that in a patient with untreated active HIV AIDS in South Africa, who was co-infected with one of the original sars cov virus 2 uh, isolates, so, so potentially an animal-based like bat or, or rodent-based, who also had coronavirus OC43, that the, the cause of the common, one of the causes of the common cold. In that patient, a mixing event occurred, similar to what occurs uh, with, with uh, the, the avian influenza and way back when swine flu. And so the Omicron variant carries genetic material of the far more contagious but less virulent a coronavirus OC43. So that may be why early suggestions are that it is less virulent, although I caution all of us from, from adopting that as a 100% uh, gold standard truth. It's just too early to see or to say just how virulent Omicron might be. But in countries that, that have been with a prominent uh, presence of Omicron for the last several weeks, they are reporting a 28 to 30% decreased hospitalization rate and, ho and a severe disease rate in those patients with the Omicron. Now, more people are getting infected, and that means that more people with at-risk uh, features, comorbidities, etc., cetera, uh, are going to be presenting to healthcare. So, so the healthcare system is still absolutely going to be overwhelmed. And it is also likely that a fair number of those with those comorbidities who are more frequently infected will experience complications, morbidity, and, and, and mortality from Omicron. So, so I, I think, again, in five years, we'll look back on this whole thing and be incredibly brilliant about what happened. But in terms of predictions right now, in general, it seems that Omicron may actually be uh, uh, behaving a bit like a combination of a rhinovirus-like coronavirus and SARS coronavirus uh, from its early days. Certainly, the number of mutations uh, are, are unheard of. 50, 5 uh, point mutations in Omicron's uh, genome, 30 of which involve the spike protein, 10 of those involve the, involve the active binding site of the spike protein. So, so uh, it appears that Omicron replicates more rapidly uh, and, and releases far more readily into respiratory secretions. 
So once again, as we work on getting more people vaccinated and more importantly boosted, the mask is going to remain our friend and we are encountering yet another pandemic surge or perhaps if you want to believe the talking heads, a new pandemic just at the time of the holidays when everyone is going to want to come out from behind the masks. So that's not good news. I'm sorry. I wanted, like anything, to say, hey, we're over Delta and our numbers are better and we're not seeing MISC and the kids are healthy. But I, I think we're just at a, a very difficult point once again at a very difficult time of year. So there you go, folks. That That is the news as we know it as of today. Thank you for listening to ID Talk. AZAAP members can submit questions for future episodes to covid at azaap.org. Uh, the AZAAP would like to acknowledge the generous support of this podcast by the Arizona Department of Health Services through the Title V Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant funding. For more information and resources related to COVID-19 in Arizona, or to learn how to become a member, please visit us at azaap.org. And again, and as always, hang in there. It's a holiday season where I know we're all trying to find some peace, joy, comfort, and serenity in this very normally difficult, troublesome time, and it's made more more so. So hold on to those you love. Go home and hug your families as, as and your friends, and and keep hanging in there, folks. We appreciate you. Thank you.